Uh oh, has that, are you still moving, Alex, or have you frozen? I okay. am. I know everybody's paranoid now. Everyone's got. Uh, well, uh, you're having everyone's those got issues. stress points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think I got it all sorted out. I find that restarting the computer, it's it's leaving Zoom and then coming back in seems to be the problem. Uh, anyway, so I think we're all we're all set here. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, Office Hours. Uh, if you're in YouTube and watching this, we're not listening to any of those comments. So you need to join the actual conversation. Uh, you can, uh, it'll be a little clink, little link down below. You get into Zoom and from Zoom, you get into Makana and that's where you can leave chats. Uh, but if you're trying to chat in YouTube, uh, no one's watching. So um, you can put whatever you want there, but, but there's not, not gonna, no one's going to read it. Uh, so um, we start this uh, <laughs> early at about five uh, and, then, um, and then we start getting mo a little more serious at six and then we actually start talking for real at seven. So it's kind of second breakfast. And anyway, so um, if you'd like to be on this panel, if you if you listen to us and you and you think that you might know more than us, you might. And um, and we would uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, uh, what you need to do is be here by 640. Uh, we then do the mic checks. And um, and if you have good audio and good video, uh, then um, then we'll have you on. So so anyway, so join by 640. You can join the panel. We'd love to have you have you join us. If you're not going to join the panel, your job is to ask questions. So uh, we expect questions uh, from you. That don't don't think that there's there's no free ride here. Uh, so um, so ask the questions. And if you're not going to ask the questions, there is one other thing you can do, and that's the vote on the questions. Um, we're starting to get to a point where we run out of time for all the questions. And so if you if if they're not voted up, you might not get to them. We get to mo get to most days, but like yesterday. We didn't get to all, all of them. So so uh, the voting is very, very important. So uh, make sure to do that. Of course, first hour is all general questions. Second hour is a special, um, you know, whatever we've decided we're going to talk about. In this second hour, we're going to talk about how people got into the business. So we'll talk a little bit about how different people in the panel got into the business. Uh, and you can share a little bit about what you got in, how, how you got into it. And we'll just hopefully give people some clues or some breadcrumbs on how they can actually get into uh, any business, but but specifically into media, um, and then um, and then we do that every day. <laughs> so seven o'clock, there's general discussion every day, seven days a week, uh, and then we have these special um, things that we talk about uh, in the uh, in the second hour. So tomorrow will be our special hour. Will be on education. It is every Saturday, and then Sunday. We just extend it two hours. So um, so anyway, so that's kind of the the plan there. Um, I did. Uh, put out the discord link a little late so it is in the mukana chat and um i think we'll go ahead and jump into questions go ahead bill okay our first one today surprisingly not at all comes from hasmuk in cape town and he says hi everybody what quick tips and advice can you give my professor on managing the refresher course we plan to manage in january so hasmuk can you explain a little bit about what you're trying to do there so I've mentioned before we're doing this refresher course, and as we discussed on office hours, I have the head of department here, Professor Ntusi. I challenge everybody to pronounce his name, but I didn't go through that. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, we're doing a pre-recording of all the lectures. There are 18 lecturers. Uh, we're going to pre-record it, and then we're gonna put that content on a learner management platform and put a little bit of quiz as well. We're hoping to do it at least seven to 10 days before the event. And then the event runs over four days. And over the four days, instead of a lecturer delivering the content of the lecture like they do in-person meetings, we will use that to have a discussion and, 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 and a Q&A uh, for each of these. So the people who are writing the exams are writing the speciality exam. And with COVID, obviously, everybody's very anxious and crunched for time to study. So this refresher course is really, really important. So I brought the professor to, to endorse <laughs> the support I get from office hours and say to him, we have a global team of, as Alex says, centuries of experience to give us support and advice. And we have specialists like Grant in who deals with medical things. So I just wanted you to uh, sort of uh, resonate in what, what we're trying to do. First of all, I think that the direction that you're going with giving people the videos early and then and then having a discussion is definitely the best way to go. Um, you know, I think that um, you want to give people some time 
to watch the videos and to think about them. Uh, when they when you just present the materials, that's the first time they saw saw it, and they don't necessarily have the time to to really think through it and have the best questions. So I think that there is a huge advantage in sending out those um, the the content early. Uh, one thing I would think about is how to have how to provide a place for people to discuss those videos even before the video, even before the the conference. So if they get it seven to ten days before, is there a Discord or a forum or something else where they can start the discussion immediately? Uh, what that'll also do is is build some of the questions that you may use at the beginning of each session. Here are some questions that came from the discussion. So people have been discussing these already. Um, here are the here are some of the things that have already come up, and uh, and then and then provide that. So I think that that is a uh, putting up the the videos early, then having those discussions. I think make a lot of sense. Um, I think that uh, the other thing to do is just always to manage um, to manage the the participants over and over and over again. <laughs> so so they would get the videos, but a reminder the night before for each night of you know at, at five o'clock in the afternoon, you might have uh, here are the here are the videos that you should watch for tomorrow. Here are the videos you should watch for tomorrow. Each day you do that just to make sure that right at the top of their thought process, they know what videos, so if they're going to cram, if they're going to do it right at the last minute, that they will do it in a, uh, in a way that, uh, th that they will have watched them beforehand. And they're somewhere easy for them to find it. It may seem repetitive, but that way they don't have to search their emails to try to find uh, what, what they have to watch for tomorrow if they wait until the last minute. So um, I think that those would be the things that I would do. And then I definitely agree with you that that asking, you know, opening it up for questions, is, as you can see here, we open up for questions as fast as we can. So, so it is a it is a very uh, good practice, I believe, to to do that. Uh, go ahead, Alex. I don't know if it would be possible, but I think um, to create the beginning of the Q and A, I think it would be good, if possible, to create a thirty second version or one minute version of what was in the video, just to kind yeah. of um, make a moment, a moment of saying, "This is what we all saw." right and then they actually <laughs> see it and they go and then they see the last moment the last summary the last slide or the last part of the video which is the thing that is the you know and then people can at least they're off to the races so i think a little moment to actually say we're beginning now and it's instead of saying we all saw the video it's like here's what we all should have seen is slightly different yeah and 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 the thing to think about with the videos is and this may be hard to do at this point but to think about having almost that summary is the first 30 seconds or a minute of the real video that you do. These are the highlights of the things that you need to know from this video. Then go into the video, you know, and, and one of the things that we're experimenting with a lot is building those videos in layers where you get just the overview of, of what you have to walk away from, then uh, more data and then deeper data. And you keep on going through the same thing over and over again, deeper, so that um, people can choose for how long they want to watch. But it also helps their mind put create uh, in many ways when we build the videos, we want to first create the shelves for where they're going to put the ideas. <laughs> so oftentimes uh, our talks, our videos give us a bunch of ideas with no shelves. You know, there is no place to put them. So we have to think about ways to talk about it and how to structure the conversation and the information so that they're ready to put those, those new ideas into, or the old ideas that they should have, this is a refresher, but put them into boxes that, that make sense for them. Go ahead, Mickey, and then Courtney. Yeah, I think it's mentioned here every day, uh, practice, 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 and test. Test everything. You should be testing things right now. Um, every time you run a test, you will discover something you want to improve, you want to change, you want to, you want to fix. And yeah, as Alex mentioned, you want it to start to feel boring, get to a point where it's, it starts to feel boring because then you, you, it's a routine now. You can, you can do it uh, without having to think very hard about what you're doing. And, and as, as, we've, as you can see from what we, what we just did before this beginning of the show, there is a mic check because audio is the most important thing. If you send anything out to the speakers, the most important thing is, is a microphone. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, one thing you might think about is something Alex does here every day is, is to kind of do a preamble on each video, reminding people that 
the uh, question uh, to write down questions as they watch the video because they'll have the opportunity to ask those questions in a q a session later now you might make that as a separate preamble in case that video is going to be cut off and used later after the q a session or made available later where where it won't be referring to a q a session that has already occurred so um, you might use that as a as we do here alex always reminds people to put in your questions right at the top of the show and to to take notes and uh, you you can ask your questions later i'll be very excited to see how it goes i think it'll be very interesting yes uh next question Moving on to a question from Emily Russo, who's often in our educators panel here, and she's in Red Hook and says, I have an agriculture teacher and she needs to take the kids out to the animals on the farm for virtual demos. She uses Zoom, but the internet is only Wi-Fi in the barn. What's the best live stream to Zoom options for her? And of course, as with many educators, money is an issue. So I mean the, the 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 biggest challenge is it's it's hard to do it it's hard to do it stably um, and inexpensively at the same time. So that's that's the biggest challenge that you're going to have. Uh, just remember, I know this will sound crazy, but Ethernet can go a long way. So so if you're if you're not too far away from a, I mean we, you can run Ethernet, you know, and if you buy it from Monoprice, even 300 feet of Ethernet. Not that expensive, and uh, and so you know you want to think about having that. Uh, you want to think about having it be something that you can uh, get closer to. I think the Wi-Fi could break up a little bit. It may be fine, you know, to have the Wi-Fi break up if it only has it. You know, you might want to just do a lot of tests uh, at the barn. Um, but uh, what I would do is I would try to get a transmitter um, for a wireless transmitter for the camera. And then I would run an Ethernet <laughs> to where it was in the barn. Um, the problem you'll have with barns, uh, a modern barn will have a lot of steel structure. So with anything, whether it's Wi-Fi or other things, you're going to have transmission is going to be very low. So you're going to want to make sure that the AP is not doesn't isn't close to um, metal. So all the you know all the infrastructure that's within it. Um, if it's an old barn, you may have more wood which will probably be a little bit, a little bit better, but you'll still have a lot of the rail railings and, and gates and, and so on and so forth. And I know a lot about the inside of barns. <laughs> so, so the, um, uh, so you just want to, you want to think about, think about those things as you, uh, as you start to do it. I think it's an incredible idea. Um, I think taking kids out for, I mean, any kind of virtual, um, uh, you know, I think that schools could be doing a lot of this. I'm kind of surprised that Penn State hasn't just made this a service. You know, like that's, you know, that's the, um, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania and Penn State has, their ag is pretty, uh, it's pretty deep. And, um, and I'm just surprised that they haven't made it a service to schools where that they have it all set up with cameras and lights and they'll take you out and, and do the thing. I think that some of the ag, ag related colleges would do well to provide that for schools, even if it's just for gathering more, more applicants for their school. Um, anyway, so, uh, but I would, you know, the thing that you want to think about is transmission and try to keep that transmission as short as possible between the AP or a receiver and, and where you're at. Go ahead, Jeffrey, and then Bill, and then Raphael, and then Chris. The one question I have is, is this going to be a camera that you're going to be carrying with you, or is this going to be a camera that's going to be just set down and then you do what you do and then move the camera? In because a barn? If that's the case, because if that's the case, then what you want to do is you want to definitely... A, uh, do like an HDMI cable into a laptop or a desktop and use uh, use as little Wi-Fi as possible. And maybe even have yourself a, an extender close by just in case to hit the, the odd spots. Yeah. the uh, If you want to roam around, I, I will say in a barn, I would almost always or any kind of those interactives, I would almost have it. I would almost always have it handheld. I just think you're going to have, it'll feel very square to kids if you're just on a tripod, you know? So I think that you're going to want to have it handheld, um, but you could still, to Jeffrey's point, have a, a cable going into a computer. And then again, I would find out where the closest uh, ethernet is and try to get to it. I uh, go ahead, Bill. Just because you mentioned really long runs of cable, uh, when I was starting out, we had I had carried all sorts of stingers around, long extension cords to get to power. And one of the best things I did early was buy inexpensive plastic wind-up reels so that you can lay out a cable temporarily, but also reel it back in neatly. With 300-foot cables, even the coiling and, and storage of them can become a hassle. And if you get them kinked and messed up, it becomes a nightmare. 
and it adds extra time to your setup that you just don't want to deal with. Good, Raphael. Uh, well, uh, if the barn is metal and uh, you have uh, Wi-Fi equipment inside, it, it acts as a Faraday cage towards the signals coming from the outside. So you have much less issues with, uh, with uh, the neighbor's hardware. So you would have a much better uh, signal inside the barn as you'd be like the only, uh, the only uh, mobile device inside. And I don't think you'd have any issues with the Wi-Fi itself, as long as this is connected to a proper network with fiber or something going outside the barn. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Yeah, I, I sent you this image earlier this week. I get tired of having the conversation with people. Well, how, how far are you from, from the router? So I, I made this graphic the other day. You're uh, far from the router, you're in the beat up car. If you're close to the router, you're in the Pinto. But if you go to ethernet, you know, you're doing okay. And I get, I just, people are like, yeah, you can move closer to the router if you feel comfortable driving a pinup, yep. you know? I mean, well, and, and you may, you may decide that that's the best you can do. And, and I think that it's worth doing, even if for the kids, I think it's worth going to see the cows no matter what, you know, even if it breaks up a little bit. So you'll have some stalls and you'll have some other things, cows but I cool. would, I would, you know, cows are cool. <laughs> so, so anyway, they're a lot of fun. Um, uh, so uh, I would, I would think about, I think it's worth doing. Um, but I think that I would, I would, uh, if you can get ethernet, if not try to get the AP within line of sight of what you're going to, what you're going to move around on, I think is a key to the operation. Go ahead, Chris. What's AP? Oh, your access point. Thank oh, you. Thank you. As, yeah. Assuming thank some you. of us may not know. Yeah, yeah, I just exactly. to so the a, you want to get the, a, the access point as close as you can. Um, and you may find that your cell phone, depending on what the cell service is there, your cell phone, your cell service sometimes is better than the Wi-Fi. Um, you know, as far as it just, it just might be more stable. Uh, so the, the, what I would say is try to get out there if you can get there or have someone test it a day before, a couple of days before, just so you know what you're getting into. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I would say if you have to rely on Wi-Fi, uh, set it set it up at least for the day that on a and a on a uh, st a different SSID and password so that no one else is using that access point um, right. or if possible set up a totally separate access point from that. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, you bring up the subject of the location survey. I would never, ever, ever shoot in any location that was at all remote without doing a full-scale location survey, which is going out would, and making sure. I would love to say that I would never, ever, but I definitely have had not, not the opportunity to do that. Uh, but but I, I, I definitely try to avoid it uh, as much as possible. Uh, next question. Moving on to uh, Michael Vospin of Woodstock, Georgia, who says, iPhones as Zoom cams. Can I run lightning to HDMI cables from multiple iPhones, send them all HDMI into an A10 mini, then into Zoom on my Mac? The answer is absolutely. Filmic Pro will give you a clean aperture out. Um, I've been doing a ton of work in Filmic Pro. Super happy with it. <laughs> it's just a cool, it's a really cool app. And, uh, and so you had a ton of control and you can, you can basically just little, you flip a little bit and it, uh, it switches to clean aperture out. Um, and it's, there's other, there's a lot of other tools that will do clean aperture out. They just won't give you as much control of the camera. So, so sure you can use something else, but Filmic Pro will give you a ton of control over your camera and a clean aperture, uh, Paul and then Tony. Yeah. On the cable, I would recommend a three-way cable where you have a USB power source and the uh, lightning so so that your phone doesn't uh, go into a low battery state. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, go ahead, uh, Tony. Yeah, I just wanted to add that what Alex said and what Paul said is absolutely correct. Filmic Pro is fantastic. I would just encourage you to use a Apple certified adapter with the lightning and you'll guarantee that you won't have any issues that's great yeah and, I, and i'm working on i'm slowly cobbling together all the pieces I've, I've got so many phones in my house right now and i'll have a couple of iphone 12s that i'm going to kind of try to cut between so we'll i think on a saturday or sunday we'll, we'll play with it go ahead uh, jeffrey maybe this saturday and gaff and gaff tape have gaff tape nearby so you can uh, if you're doing a lot of adapters it's best to put a piece of gaff tape on so it doesn't disconnect it is, and um, 
uh, shrink wrap is is cool too. If you want to just build one that is the cable, you just, you put the little you put the cables in, and then you put the shrink wrap on, and then you shrink it to it, and then it's there forever. Uh, next question. Moving on to T.J. Asher's question from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Sky, how did the party go? Can we get a breakdown? And what successes or failures did you run into? I'd be happy to. Uh, several of you, I, I have not been able to say thank you for jumping on. So, Alex, we did use the, the team here before the show went live Wednesday night. And they all checked us out. And the... Interesting thing is, of course, the audience is using their laptops and their video quality is is um, what a laptop would look like in a kitchen. So it's a it's a horrible image, but it's all about their opening the box. They're grabbing the the items, the food items that we had shipped to them. So, Alex, your your metaphors and your your examples are, are working and I'm grateful. And uh, it went very well. And we're looking to do it again with the. Um, about four more times in the next month. So this uh, party in a box concept is is on a roll. And one of the things that we did, of course, is is send we sent uh, webcams to everybody. <laughs> so uh, and, and, and it doesn't have to be an expensive webcam. This is actually less important for the participants. And this is unusual, yeah. but even a thirty or forty dollar webcam. But what what it what was important was a quarter twenty because what we did is we sent them a little yeah. tripod. I think we actually sent them a little Joby. Uh, with the webcam yeah. so that their laptop wasn't close to the stove. And, th and that was learned from the first one we did uh, because it's not, it's not so much someone dropped the laptop into the stove, which would have been bad or into the, into the soup. It was splatter. So yeah. that was the thing that we had. Someone got pretty, I got a pretty long email after one of our events about how the grease spatter had gotten into the keyboard. So, so that, you know, so that's when we, and just, just as a note, that's when we started sending out cameras with cables and yeah. something so that the laptop could be a little further away and the, and, and it also lets them grab onto the camera and just, and show yeah. them, show you what they're doing. They're like, Oh, look at this, look at this, this is what I'm doing here. And so it kind of gave them a, a thing to kind of uh, point around that wasn't their laptop. So just something to think about as that goes through, Appreciate goes forward um, as, you know, and a lot of times if it's expensive if you think of, oh, I'm going to send it out. But if you just add it into the budget for per, per person of what you're sending is, oh, yeah, we're going to send this little kit that goes out. Oftentimes you can slide it in there. What, um, if, what if someone... we are finding is that these uh, these executive assistants have a budget for holiday parties. And it's they're basing it oh, yeah. on the per person yeah. at a hotel model. And yeah. so we're we're kind of working into that line item in their history. And... Yeah we're not balancing out because we don't have the whole infrastructure of a restaurant and a food services and, mm -hmm. and catering and all of that. And we're still doing 90% of that same experience. So it's, we're, we're trying to balance that budget issue. So there you go. We're having fun. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Alex, I was wondering if you or possibly Sky could take advantage of this. Um, have you ever experimented with using the ability through Zoom to, you can actually cycle through the cameras that are available on a, on a system. So like if, if you request camera control and I have a Brio, you can pan and tilt and zoom, you know that, but you can also cycle through the active cameras. I and, know that. and maybe you could do something sky where you have the wide shot and then you have, you know, a, a closer camera for the cooking stuff or whatever. It might be fun oh, to be able we, to we did that exact experience on uh, with StreamYard with our show because we had five cameras in the other chef's house. This experience that we did was a party and then I was the host. So consequently, I could manage and spotlight for everybody. And what was a lot of fun was people were, I love the, the their end experience was, I was so afraid to do this. I didn't know, I don't cook, I'm, but this is so much fun. And then she's, Right. This big glob of cheese is stretched out and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's a fun. We definitely went on the, on the many different ways that we've done this, whether it was wine tastings and cheese tastings and or cooking together or all these other things that we've a beer tasting. We did beer tasting um, whiskey and and cheese tastings, which is what I didn't. I never saw that coming. Um, and uh, so we we uh, on all of those, we thought this is just such a fun platform. And this is five years ago. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity to do a lot more of that. And I think that um, 
you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see if people take more advantage of it. Um, next question. Moving on, TJ Asher has another one, and this is the big one from today. We are talking about this beforehand, whether or not Alex wants to do it. Can Alex 4D give us a live unboxing of his new AirPods Max? Can you do it? Can you do it, Alex? Um, I, I can. I mean, I don't know if we want to go through the whole thing, but actually the oh, weird yeah. thing is oh, yeah, that I, I just want to zoom back out on the on my on my camera a little bit so you can see a bit more. The first thing to say is the bo unboxing experience actually starts with the boring box. This doesn't look like an Apple box. In fact, it actually looks kind of user hostile. It's got this kind of thing saying this has got a bad battery in it, you know, dangerous battery, all that kind of stuff. So it starts off like that. That, 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 keeps them, that, that keeps them from disappearing at the doorstop. Exactly. So it says it just looks like boring old thing with like, oh, it's got chemicals in it. I don't know if I want to, want to steal Biohazard. it. Biohazard. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but what it has here, I've taped this back up because I've already opened it. This part of it is that it's got a tiny little um, arrow mm -hmm. pointing down. I don't know if you can quite see that. I've taped it up so I can do it. And what happens is you pull this apart and suddenly you realize this box is not like other boxes. Because what it's doing is it's not it's like those Amazon it. boxes. It's not like an Amazon box. It's kind of. It's presenting it. Yes. So that's, if I, that's actually an Apple box, not an Amazon box, by the way. Exactly. That's my point is the fact that this is, you can tell this is not an, uh, I can't position myself and the microphone in the box. Anyway, but it actually kind of, it presents it. The actual, both parts yep. open up and they've got a little bit of a kind of springy material on the I'm, inside. I'm surprised that it doesn't play like a little, like, like have does like it, one, like, does like it a little thing where it does like 2001. I was expecting at least the startup chime would have been nice or something like that. So I throw that box away, of All course. folks, Alec. So here we have the actual thing itself. Now, this as on normal app, oh, so sorry about this stuff. This is actually some ink that's on my finger now. I'm embarrassed about that. Um, this is embossed like most boxes are. So all the illustrations and photos are embossed, mm -hmm. including the underwear on, that it comes with on the back. Um, <laughs> so here we are. I've got an instruction here. A little, a little, as I'm not focusing very well, the Brio can't quite see handle it, it. We, but there we you can go. see it, a little arrow. Yeah, and then so obviously I'll, I'll now get it close, have no plans. Get it close to the microphone so we can hear it. Oh, yeah, the SMR. I, I pulled it horizontally, but oh, okay. You didn't follow the instructions, did you? No. Should have read the manual. They, they, they gave you an arrow. <laughs> Just wanted you had to get one the... instruction. You only had one thing to do. Now look at it. If you don't follow the instructions, this is Apple's. This is Apple's version of hey, you don't follow instructions. No, this happens. is heathen unboxing mode now. We're right. just no, gonna tear it get in there. All right, you're all not, right. So, you're so not you opened unboxing it, up. it right. Yeah. Okay, there's a little crinkle. Okay, so I'm going to hold this box up, and then it's one box inside. It's like a movie present. In other words, mm -hmm. you have to open it instantly, like in the movies. There's no yeah. actual real get unwrapping. Your, get your nose nose up there. You got to smell it. You gotta smell the new. All right, all right. And here they're rubbing of it. <laughs> Got a little ASMR there. Yeah, that I'm ruining. It's very bright. So it looks like the actual carry cases. Oh, this is not the actual carry case. This is the covering for the carry cases. That so it's not as pink as it looks. So we'll take it out. Ta -da! And it's of course my first reaction. Oh my god, this is so heavy. Which is, of course is what everyone's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I. Okay, so I'm now going to remove this little bit of plastic off the... Oh! No. I did, there's no arrow, so I'm just having to go with... Yeah. Does it just pull off? Does it just make it pull mode? It Maybe. I think what I need to do is I, I need to actually undo the magnet, and then I can take the paper off it. Sorry, there was there a... Go. This is holding it in, and then... Mm -hmm. So I got actually lost in the opening for myself and forget that I was on camera. And we can only mm -hmm. imagine how many meetings and R&D there was just for that piece of paper. <laughs> that's okay thing so um not pristine that's not, um, crazy out of box so here we have the bra or whatever you want to call this thing so i can it just slides off and there's a bit of tape on there i'm not quite sure what that is read the arrows oh. read the arrows <laughs> so it just it's the um statutory stuff so it says this might Apple Inc. One Apple Parkway Cupertino, and then the postcode for some reason. Uh, where's it gone? There it is. Oh, it's actually underneath the there. So put them on. Tell us what you think. And that's the only that's the only branding that's on there. Is that removable sticker? Huh? 
Mm. Yes. So there's no sign this is an Apple product, apart from the fact that it's obviously an Apple product. And also this cardboard on number somewhere. Yeah, there's that's on the inside inside of one of these cups is the serial number. So and does it have a re- does it have a, a left and right sewn into the inside? Yeah. So that's kind of cool. you can't quite see it, but that actually is a has a says L on it. It's sewn in a way. Oh, maybe you can just about see that it mm-hmm. says. Maybe the R is going to be easier to see. No, we see it. Oh, I there's the yeah. yeah. So there's I won't also be able to volume hear you. knob on that, right? Anyway, yes. Anyway, so I'm just going to put it on to see how heavy it is. I'm stretching it out, and it's very comfortable. <laughs> it feels like it's kind of sucking onto my ears. I and would it's hope very so. kind of. Uh, I'm in a hermetically sealed environment. It's not even on. Yeah. So this was the very, best wow. office hours segment ever. Thank you. <laughs> it's Thank you suck for me this. In, into we haven't reality. done. We haven't done unboxings. I guess that's going to be a new segment is the unboxings, yeah. the, un- the, the the office hour unboxings. But I think we'll have to move them to the pre-show normally. So we would <laughs> have like unboxings at 6.30. Like, well, no, no, we'll have unboxing. No, no, they have to come mm. early. They have to come early. As long as it's Alex narrating it. That was <laughs> exactly. awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Hey, Alex, show, show off the buttons. Because that's, that's, oh, yeah. that's one of the keys right there. So... Um, what we actually need to do, Alex, is one of the Mystery Science Theater 3000. Well, we all watch him unbox it and comment on how he right, is right. unboxing right. and whether he's so doing this, it right. So it does have the digital crown yep. on there. <laughs> so it's like a giant watch. Yeah, it's a very big watch. And that's a, it's it's like a, white a huge watch on your ear. If they, put the, if they put the time on the outside, you can just like lay it down on the desk and you have a clock. And this is the thing that changes the actual uh, amount of um, noise. Uh, yep. Suppression, or whatever you want to call it. That's great. Come here, just so you can hear it. I was late to order mine, so I'll get it sometime next year. So we'll we'll see when when I actually have them. But that that I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. Looks great. All right, let's uh, let's move on. We got a bunch of questions. Thank you, Alex. Thank so you for uh, uh, the... you're very kind to do your unboxing in front of all of us. We we very much appreciate it. Uh, that was great. And and if you ever want to unbox other things, we'll just have an Alex section when when there's something for. But you have to do the commentary, the Alex Golner commentary. It's it's perfect. All right, all right. Next question. Moving on. Mark Harder in Brooklyn, New York, asks, "What actual piece of hardware do you use to feed video output of a switcher?" into Zoom, a decimator into Thunderbolt, that as HDMI options for HDSDI? Typically we're using, uh, for the most part, like what I'm using right now, I have a, a 6K with that's going HDMI into a ATEM Mini Pro, and then the ATEM Mini Pro just shows up as a camera for Zoom. So the switcher itself is doing that. Now, if you're going SDI, there's not a lot of SDIs that can, that SDI switchers that go directly in. I think that my guess is by July of next year, all the new ATEM switchers will probably have some way to stream to the internet and to connect as a as a as a camera. That's my guess. Um, but uh, but right now, uh, you would need to have one more piece, one more box in there. You can use something like this. This is a this is a web presenter without the front face, um, and so. Uh, but a web presenter is, is one way to do that. That'll convert the HDSDI into 720p. You can also use a mini recorder. Um, and uh, there's a variety of other interfaces to get in, uh, Magewells and um, other ones there. George? So I'm just using a bi-directional out of the camera into my AT- to get into my ATM mini. And then I have the SDI portion going to a video assist so I could kind of get a cleaner image to see mm-hmm. what's going on. Yep. Uh, Mickey? Yeah, if it's just Zoom and you don't need uh, 10-bit, uh, I'm a big, big fan of the AJA UTAP. They come in both HD, SDI, and uh, USB, mm-hmm. HDMI versions. That's great. Um, Courtney? Yeah, I'd keep an eye on Blackmagic because I think that web presenter, I think, is 720p max, and uh, I think they're going to update it, I bet, to 1080. So I sure hope so. All their other, since their ATEM minis do it, they should be able to do it easily. So I, I bet they're going to come out with a new version this year. Be- the only advantage of the of the web presenter is not all not everything sees the A10 mini or 1080p, and so the I have found that that the web presenter I keep I keep them around because they are the absolute will show up as a webcam an old webcam won't do anything special and always gets into everything that I want to go into, and it's not always the case with everything else. Next question. 
Moving on, we have George Kennedy Jr., who's in Washington, D.C., and often on the panel, saying, any recommendations for a compact prompter? I found myself not looking into the camera yesterday. So uh, two things. One is the one that, that we just bought a lot of that <laughs> has been very successful. I think we got 11 or 12 of them in the last month is the ICANN 12-inch uh, portable prompter, about 800 bucks. And um, it is a... Uh, small prompter. It, it is an actual video screen. Um, it's not the best screen in the world or the best prompter in the world, but it's compact and relatively inexpensive. And um, and we were able to use it relatively effectively. Um, and we sent them out on kits and people were able to put them together. And that was a good sign. The thing to know if you really want to get compact and you still want to screen is that um, Lilliput makes uh, monitors with a quarter inch on the side and a quarter inch on the back. And if you're a little if you're a little uh, creative with your printing, you can print little ones that you can fold up. Just remember that it's just a little piece of glass that's silvered. So you just got to get that at the right angle and, and you have a teleprompter. Go ahead, Bill, and then, and then George. So I use a less expensive one. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. It's this one. I got it off of Amazon. It was a couple hundred bucks. Uh, it has downsides, which is that the sled underneath where you put an iPad or whatever your source is, I happen to use a Lilliput, um, I think, 10 inch that does the flip and the rest of those things built into that. But that adds a couple more hundred bucks on top of things. But this thing has a plastic bed that's kind of designed for an iPad. So if you're doing actual prompting and stuff like that, the base is not super stable. And I don't think I would put this into a kit that's going in and out all the time. But if you have a fixed desktop circumstance, it works just fine. Go ahead, George. So I guess after a few months of us doing office hours, I find myself looking at the screen. My camera is actually up here. So it's kind of above my head right now. So I have, if I need to look at it, I need to look up. Um, this is the image from yesterday. I had Larry on from OWC. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually using vMix. So I found myself looking at, and it's an AB switcher, obviously. I find myself looking at the program output. So that's why I'm looking off into the opposite direction. I mean, I'm, I'm my own worst critic, critic, like many of us. So I... Obviously, if I'm going to do this more often, I'm going to have guests on. I need to figure out a way of kind of looking into the camera more, but I don't have the low. My monitor could only drop like one more inch onto the desk. So I need to figure out how to get it more of an eye level yeah. so I could look. And the one thing I will say is that, that while I have a small, relatively inexpensive one, which is the ICANN 12, I'm, my next purchase sometime in the near future will be a, 20, a, pro, a prompter people or whatever, 24 inch. Um, I've had a bunch of those that I haven't had recently. And for what we're doing here, it's just nicer to have a bigger screen. And so, uh, you know, I think that for teleprompting, it's actually not very good because it, it actually creates eye scan. But, um, uh, but for, uh, for actually looking at people and looking at interfaces, uh, we've actually built ones that are 50 inches because it just, it was easier to see the whole screen while we were working. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, I would recommend if you get one of those little compact uh, prompters like... Um uh was shown by bill earlier if you're looking for a monitor these e i found these e yo-yos on uh, amazon they're eight inch monitor they're about 62 bucks they're four by three so they're good for prompting they're 1024 by 768 and they have a multitude of inputs they've got composite hdmi vga and um on the back and so they're they're and they have image reverse, so they're great for using as a prompter. They're really lightweight. They're plastic, so they're not going to add a lot of stuff if you're going to use it on the camera and handhold it. Um, and we use them on, on a lot of our prompters. And also above the lens if, if you can't put a beam splitter in front of it. But it does do image reverse. That's great. Um, and what's, what's the name of that again? EO, like E yo yo, like a, the letter E in front of a yo yo. Oh, nice. E yo yo. And just, and they make them an eight inch, 10 inch, and so on. And, and they're very versatile as far as input goes. So, uh, Guy? Yeah, I was going to show the, uh, what it looks like with a larger monitor. The cool thing is that you can uh, fit more, you know. So I took the 24 inch, uh, I replaced the 17 and, and gave myself more resolution here. So now I can see. Um, the text for uh, yep. Mukana teleprompt in the back end, um, whatever uh, is pinned, and then also the gallery view. So it's, it's kind of nice when you're looking at getting a teleprompter, you want to be aware of 1024 by 768 versus 1920 by 1080. Sweet. And I've just got it. And you kind of see. And is that the prompter people one? Like that. Yeah, that's the prompter people one. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
Yeah. Next question. Moving on, our next question comes to us from Vernon Campbell in Princeton, Illinois, and Vernon, oh, Keenan Campbell, I'm sorry. Um, pricing jobs out. How does one start to price jobs? It seems like some clients don't see the value in professional gear and talent and so forth. Note, especially now with iPhones everywhere and amateur videographers everywhere. You know, I think that what you what you're looking for are the clients that do, <laughs> you know, so so, you know, clients who, 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 you know, like I think that that's the, the the goal is to find the clients. It's really not a matter of the clients not existing. It's just finding them. So, um, you know, we can talk about that a lot, but but it, it, the, the clients that really don't think that there's any value in it um, generally are difficult, difficult clients forever. You know, and so, so you just want to kind of think through that a little bit. I know that we just want to get the work and you do want to get as busy as you can. Uh, if you're not busy, take the, I mean, I'm, if you're to a certain level, if you're not busy, take work just to get work because you'll get better at it and someone else is paying for you to figure it out. But um, at the same time, uh, there is a side of getting, you know, just getting really, you know, getting really good at being scrappy. But I think that you want to constantly be looking for the clients that are going to let you stretch out a little bit um, or, or let you do that professionally in every, I haven't found a place where that doesn't exist. It's just a matter of, you know, finding them. Um, go ahead, George. So is this, is this fair of a, well, get in the gig you want to, but I would say what I had a couple of RFPs that I had to do for next year, make sure that you, especially if you're going to be working with a team, find out what their day rate is and go from there. Because the last thing you want to do is bid on something and on the bid yourself and you have to pay crew. You're going to suffer if you on the bid and you can't, you know, meet your marks. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and, and, it, but again, they're, they're there because there's people who just want it to be good and they don't want to work on it themselves. And then there's people who just think that this should be done for 10 cents. Man, they're just very difficult, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, and, and the only thing dip, more difficult than a corporate client that wants to, that keeps on telling you they could do it with their phone or they, or their kids can do it or whatever are nonprofits because they don't have any, the thing you have to be careful about with nonprofits is they don't have any value. They don't value time because they have lots of volunteers and they'll just drive you into the ground. So, so you just have to be careful. It's not that you shouldn't do it. You just have to go into it with the proper expectations. Go ahead, Chris. We're going to start moving pretty quick because we're, we're a little behind. I'll pass. It's okay. fine. Yep. Uh, next question. Moving on to one from Chris Fenwick of Sacramento, tearing a page out of Alex Lindsay's playbook. I recently started creating better pitch graphics in Keynote. They helped me formulate my own thoughts and strategies. What other tools are people using for pitching jobs? Omnigraffle is pretty deep in my, in my, uh, my wheelhouse. Um, I, I use Omnigraffle a lot because, um, uh, keynote doesn't do uh, magnetic um, very well. <laughs> so, so keynote will do the connect. They'll connect one thing with one B spline that's going through the, that, that's going through it. But what it doesn't do is let you really build something and connect things really quickly and build kind of a flow graph. So if I want to do a flow graph, I still end up in OmniGraffle um, and, and, and building those out. And OmniGraffle also has a better grid system. So you can build up a grid and then you can snap things to it and, and build it out. And so I think for me, the big, the big one is, um, I mean, I would say 99% of my presentation graphics come out of OmniGraffle and Keynote, you know, and, and then I might use other, other little bits and pieces to put, you know, to source things into it, but that's generally that. And then when I build, I don't build, I don't, ever well i won't say never but i very rarely build a keynote that is designed to be read i build a keynote that i'm going to present you know and then if i want to add a bunch of text to it i do it in pages <laughs> like that's what that, that that's what that app was built for and then so then if i want dense dense stuff i actually turn it into a document that is you know because pages is still going to make it look way nicer than word you know and so you can lay things out if you you know and, and so on and so forth and i think that as we see the interactivity in both pages and, and keynote improve, um, which I believe we'll see next year. Um, it'll get much more interesting. Go ahead, Bill, and then Paul. 
I was just going to amplify everything Alex said. Those are exactly the same tools I use. I've been using OmniGraffle for about 10 years, and it's fabulous for just getting ideas down and figuring out how one thing leads to another. And it's really easy to, oh, I forgot that, and just toss another block in between something, and it goes in the grid where it's supposed to. Uh, same thing with Keynote. All the presentations that I do for clients end up on Keynote in the end. The only other thing I use, and that is for the money part of things. Uh, decades ago, I created in FileMaker Pro a cascading bit sheet and I just did it myself and the and going through and doing it myself was one of the most important financial lessons I, lo I learned because I did it in the old style of above the line fixed kind of producer type area costs the actual production which was based on days how many days of how many cameras and how many sound days and how many the rest of those things and then a below the line that controlled um, editorial and all the things that were going to be in post-production by building that thing I had to think about them and I remember reading that when you do that, somebody recommended that you add a small percentage and it's like 6% or 3% of a contingency charge on top of those calculated rates so that you can take care of all the little things that you're not thinking about. And every job I bid, I put it through that calculation thing and it tells me the range where I'm going to be safe. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and, I do that. All, I do the same thing you do, but I just do it in numbers. So yep. I just do it in a series of sheets. So same. I have sheets that are drawn costs and then I have another sheet. So I, I have sheets that are all referring back to it. The one thing I don't do is I, I, when I build calculations, I never build, I never put raw numbers into the calculation. If I'm going to have a number, I put it somewhere on a sheet and then I refer to that so that I always have a cell that I can change so that I think this is going to, if I change the cell for a camera operator, it, it ripples through the whole thing. If I change it for this, it ripples through the whole thing. I don't have to, the, the, the thing that gets you in trouble is uh, putting actual numbers into your calculations. Your, your, your calculations inside of numbers should always be referred to, to an external cell. And usually that's an external sheet that holds all the numbers <laughs> that are there, you know, all the costs. Um, and, and so uh, that makes it a lot easier for you to build a more dynamic system uh, to do that. And, and so, um, the other nice thing about numbers is you can make it look like a presentation graphic. So the last sheet that you, that you end up putting in keynote numbers can make it look as good as keynote, you know, so you can lay it all out. It's not, it doesn't look like Excel, which is, you know, you might as well. <sighs> anyway. Um, so anyway, so, uh, you can have white space and you can have things laid out and you can have look, things look pretty. Um, and they don't have to look like Excel or sheets, um, which, um, hurts my eyes, literally hurts my eyes. Um, Paul, yeah, you and you and Bill use the word OmniGraffle. What is that word? And uh, is it cross-platform? No, OmniGraffle is Mac only. It How do you is spell a Graffle. Graffle, G R A F F L E, and it is uh, it's just an amazing flowchart and, and layout layout thing. It, it's if, it, I don't think they could ever do it cross-platform. There is a version on the iPad that doesn't work very well because you just can't have it. There's not enough detail. Go ahead, Chris, real quick, and then we're gonna move on because we we run out of time. Yeah, I was just going to say, does anybody know the difference between the free free, free version and the $250 enterprise version? I don't. I always have the pro version. <laughs> I can't remember why. There was some, That doesn't there was, surprise me. There was one version. There was something. There's something in it that I needed, and I don't remember what it was. Um, but I, I have uh, I've always used the – but I've had the pro version for many years. I mean, since version one. So um, uh, it's one of those apps that I use almost every day. Um, next question. Moving on to Alton Christensen in Brooklyn. What MP4 kilobit per second is about equal to ProRes, their standard video bit rate, a number that will work in the record option of ManyCam? Well, it's very different. They're, they're solving very different problems. If you, you know, I don't think that ManyCam, I don't even know if ManyCam goes up to ProRes, uh, I mean, levels. Um, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I have the white paper of ProRes up. Uh, it depends on the frame rate, the the resolution of the image, uh, and also, of course, what flavor of ProRes. Um, and also, it's good to note that uh, ProRes is a variable bitrate codec, and it has a target though at uh, 1080p 2997. Uh, the in regular ProRes 42, the target is 147 megabits per second, and I'll put a link to this white paper. And I, I think if you put it in the ManyCam, ManyCam would be like, "What? You know, like, what do you want? 
Uh, I don't think you need it to generally be that high, but but yeah, to get to the ProRes even LT or, or something like that, it would be pretty much higher than most MP4s are ever written. Go ahead, Felipe. Well, there is another thing that's also worth mentioning here is that ProRes has a level of compression that's much lower than H.264 would be. Yep. So yep. E 150 megabits ProRes is not going to be 150 megabits for H.264 to be comparable qualities. Plus, ProRes is recording up to 10, uh, well, over 10 bit. Well, and the other and thing is, is for most cameras is going to be 8 bit. The big thing that ProRes is also doing is, is, is setting up, a, it's an intraframe. You know, you can basically cut much more effectively. All with I. Yeah, so yeah. so you're not going to have a long gop. Long gop is what what um, MP4 generally is doing, and that's going to make it harder to cut. Um, that's the that's the real. Most of us go into a, some kind of mezzanine format. We don't cut the actual H A six sixty four almost ever. Uh, Leland, just one thing about Manicam that they might be addressing is the variable bit rate setting that comes with Manicam that you can. Oh, there goes. There goes Zoom. It crashed again. It keeps popping up crash windows yep. saying Zoom quit. Yep. Bit. Yep. That's what's happening. There's something wrong with Zoom right now. <laughs> All right. Sorry, we lost you, Leland. Uh, let's go ahead to the next question. James Babbitt here in San Diego is in with, hi, Alex. In Emily's question about visiting an agriculture setting, what wireless transmitters could work for that camera? You know, I don't know a lot of consumer wireless systems. That What I have used the most is um, Teradek bolts. So, I mean, that's the most common one to use. Um, they're not the cheapest. Uh, I know that there are other ones that are less expensive, but they're kind of, they're, they're, for us, they're, they've been the right cost performance where the one thing I will say is never rent a Teradag bolt. Um, you know, the, the, uh, they come and, or if you do, just know you need an extra day to make sure they're actually working. If they, if they show up from VER not paired, they'll never get paired. Like you, you'll spend, like I have spent hours trying to get them to pair. Um, so, uh, I just don't, I won't rent bolts, um, because they, they're hard to configure if they're not right. Um, and they can be not right often. So, um, those have been the best solution that we found though. And we've used a lot of them, um, in a lot of places. Um, I don't know of any other ones that are less expensive that are, um, stable. There, there've been a couple, go ahead, uh, Guy. Yeah, there is some from a company called Mars. Um, it's have here. It's the same chips. So they're all coming out of Israel or something like that. And uh, the Mars three hundred I've used, and surprisingly, in our building that's solid concrete, we've been able to go around bends, uh, which really shocked us in our testing. Um, we have some videos up on. Oh, YouTube these are the Hollylands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hollyland is basically the the guys that that they licensed it somehow, the technology from these guys in Israel. And we're carrying these other ones that we're hearing good results on because these ones do have SDI as well, the Vaxis Atom 500. So you might want to look at those as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those are much less expensive. So it'd be really interesting to test. Yeah, those, yeah I've, uh, I get emails from them or I get LinkedIn requests. <laughs> so I've been, I, I keep on meaning to, to have them lend me some so I can test them at my house, but I haven't uh, gotten around to it yet. Um, next question. Sound Mixer SF in San Francisco. Jesse asks, um, best pre-built option to produce a three-screen 1080p Zoom room. Image quality is paramount. Mac Mini, which model have people tested? Um, I know we we probably should. I, it's on my list to, to test this on the new Mac Mini M1s. Um, I just haven't gotten, now that they're all coming back, I'm, I have a bunch of them laying around. Um, but I don't, uh, as you know, we work with Dell's for a lot of the stuff that we could add those, those outputs to, those are pretty expensive solutions for that, but they do produce, they have the horsepower to do it. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, I've been struggling with the M1 Mac mini. Um, there seems to be some artificial limitation that says it will only output two displays. Uh, although we've seen on the internet, people doing six. Uh, I get that. Um, I'm telling you my experience. So, yep. and I've and I've watched those things. So, it doesn't make sense because it's uh, it's not a lot of pixels. If you want to do a, a three up zoom room, you're only looking for 1920, 1080 right. three times, which is less than one 4K display. But um, what I've done is I've used the HDMI output for one. I use a uh, a Thunderbolt to HDMI adapter. The uh, I've been using the other world computing, and then you have to delve into this crazy display link uh, 
world where certain adapters and a piece of software and you run the pieces of a software and then you get uh, um, USB 3 to, to HDMI. But I got to say that the reliability of that third display, it's like it works half the time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super Good frustrating. Enough, mm-hmm. And I'm considering actually taking the M1 back. Interesting. Yep. Uh-oh. So that's 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 good note. Um it's yeah, I haven't tested it yet. I we've only I've only tested but it. But I'm two. welcome to be schooled on how to do it right. Right. No. I'd absolutely. like to make it work. Yep. Yeah. No, thanks. No, next question. This comes from oh, go Steve. Ahead, guy. Guy, oh. do you want to say something real quick? Yeah, Chris Russo uh, contacted me directly, and uh, he said he was using P400, and I thought that uh, graphics cards, and I thought they were going to be some crazy expensive one because I remember P600 or something, they were like a couple thousand dollars, and I look at them, and they're like less than $200, and they have three HDMI outs, and that's how he's running his show. So it, you might want to test it. it. It sounds like you don't have to have crazy um, graphics cards, and, but he's doing HDMI dummy plugs in each one and then cycling it out NDI, uh, and he's pulling his clean feeds that way, so... Just something to do, take a look in at. In what like hardware it. do you put that card? He's putting it in a PC. It's a, in, a, in a very okay, cheap bye. PC. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. We're going to go pretty quick. Uh, we don't have a ton of questions for the second hour yet. Uh, and so and we have still have a bunch of questions from the first hour. So we're going to go run a little heavy. Um, remember, you can, uh, you can always now tag in Makana second hour. So it's easy for us to see. Um, next question. Steve Fisher in Pittsburgh on North Carolina says in using zoom closed caption for an RTMP source, I find that there's a delay in the closed captioning. This delay is much longer than the standard delay of the video signal transmitting from source to source to destination of the RTMP signal uh, problem. Closed captioning is off by more than a minute in the final. That's a pretty long delay. I didn't know zoom could, could incorporate closed captioning for an RTMP source using Zoom closed caption. I don't even understand how that works. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, Zoom, you know, uh, does captioning by streaming out and then sending the captions back in. I've used Rev, rev.com as a service, and right. Rev also released a little beta where you can pop up a browser window and sort of read it in real time. And additionally, I think Zoom just uh, opened up a live transcription feature, which is sort of native to zoom for for captions well we use but, captions with live captioners a lot or we have used it a lot um the live captioner could connect directly to zoom and it'll show up as kind of a floating uh window uh, or the um you can run it out to it's got its own service where you give a token to the captioning service and then they stream to a third party which pushes into zoom that has a higher latency it also is less lower quality than a good operator connected directly to zoom and then rev is ai so it's not the same quality but it's more flexible and a lot less expensive um but what i didn't understand is is how zoom is how someone's using zoom closed caption as an rtmp source i mean i don't i don't even know how you would stream that out like that that captioning so that's that's the part that it We'll have to do some more research on. Like I don't, I don't. Pretty sure it just goes out with the feed, Alex. If you were to have closed captioning set on during the webinar okay. broadcast, it should feed out that closed captioning to the people who turn it on. Got it. Yeah. What we do is we, of course, have uh, the capture of Zoom going, and then we have if we're going to send it out somewhere, we're usually putting it into running it through hardware that embeds the the captioning into it, uh, or use an RTMP or an R- R- HTTP input into YouTube which then you have a captioner, you know, kind of doing that live. Uh, next question. Jonas Dottel of Reutlingen is in with when building a skill library, like Alex mentioned for cooking, what's the ideal length for these videos? And then one skill per video or more? I would actually absolutely recommend one skill per video because you want to be modular. You want to just be able to say, here's, I'm going to stack up a bunch of skills. And these are the things I wouldn't, I mean, there, there may be multiple skills, in cutting an onion, but I would not have it cutting an onion and cutting something else. I would have it cutting an onion. Um, in fact, I'd probably build skills to build, to cut the onion three different ways in three different videos. Um, it's as long as it takes to show how to do it. But I, if I went more than 30 seconds on a skill, I'd be worried. You know, um, I definitely wouldn't go over 60 seconds uh, probably ever for a, for a specific skill, Jeffrey, and then Bill, and then we'll move on. And it also depends on where you're going to be putting these skills. Like for instance, YouTube wants wants you to make the longer video with uh, with the chapter markers, whereas Facebook and Instagram and things like that will want you to have that small bite size information coming through. I would never, I, just just as a side, I will never build videos for 
the search engine, you know, like, because here, here's, you never want to do, I mean, like, I, here's my opinion about that after working pretty closely with people that they're going to keep on changing what those rules are. They, they change those like the weather, you know, Oh, we want a long one. Oh, we want a short one. Oh, we want a long one. What you want to think about is what does the user want to watch and what serves this purpose? And you always build a video to what serves the, serves the viewer. Absolutely. You know, how do you serve the viewer? Absolutely. Don't worry about the search engines. Don't worry about the, what they're optimizing for. Just make great content. People who make great content. I, I don't think that I could be wrong, but I don't think like a Justine Ezrick really thinks about how the YouTube uh, engine works when she makes videos. She just tries to figure out how to make a great video, you know, and people will watch it over and over. You'll build, you'll build a connection with people over and over and over again. If you build great content, um, if you start playing around with the, the crazy things that they do, the problem is, is you're, you're just building a house on sand because that's what it is. You know, it's, it's like the, the search engines are sand, you know? And so the, 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 what, you know, building your house on a, on a rock is, building great content that serves the viewer. Um, Bill? My change in thinking was that I used to, particularly if I was just talking about something, here's a necessary thing, here's an optional way to do it, here's an optional, here's another necessary thing to do, here's another option. I got rid of all the options at that time and went, here's the necessary thing, here's the next necessary thing, here's the final necessary thing. Now you can say, and there's an option to step one, it pushes it down so yep. that the confirmation, the density of information is all top loaded. Alex has been talking about the yep. same thing. You want to catch them and keep them and give them what they need to know your external mm -hmm. optional let me talk about that is all secondary content yep. next question moving on to james babbitt here in san diego when ordering online do packages and gear arrive on time and in good condition oh there's a big big question <laughs> <laughs> it just depends not right now like this is this is christmas yeah you know, christmas during covid don't expect anything to show up on time and and hopefully it shows up in the right state i had them lose five hard drives only like two months ago where they literally they disappeared into the ether and they're like you know fifteen hundred dollars worth of drives fedex just sent and didn't know what happened to them and didn't know what where they went and didn't know like had like we've never seen them again they just disappeared somebody's got them but i don't know where um so so uh you know ensure your ensure your shipments um, and, uh, and then, uh, don't try to do anything on a tight turn right now, especially until mid January, uh, Bill and then TJ and then sky and real quick. Cause we're going to keep moving. I'm going to emphasize that real quick. I used to do a lot of work in retail and they would say the entire fourth quarter, we don't want to see your face, get out of here. Mm -hmm. We are selling. That's all we're doing is moving stuff through the process. We don't yeah. want to talk about next quarter. We don't want to talk about anything. Yeah. We're locked down. Yeah. And yeah. Good. Go oh. TJ. Mickey's favorite phrase. It depends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might get it on time. Go ahead, this guy. And boxes. I went to the Staples store. They were out of boxes. So you may want to think about recycling your boxes too. I mean, not into the yeah. recycling bin, but using the same box more than. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Michael Fisk of Spokane Valley says, I'm in the process of beginning beginning some serious video editing on my Mac. With little experience outside of some minor iMovie fiddling, I like options on Resolve versus Final Cut. I prefer learning one over the other based on ease of use and possibly cost. I still think it comes down to what you're going to do. Um, I think that if, you're, if you want to build things easily and quickly, I'm still going to say that you know, Final Cut is the way to go. If you're building technical, um, you know, highly technical edits, then I think Resolve is the way to go, especially for the stuff that I'm doing. I can't do it outside of that. But it, when I'm not, when I don't need to do the kind of work that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis right now, I go back to Final Cut. Like, you know, it's not, you know, I go back to Final Cut and I just cut it really quickly and put it all together. And the magnetic timeline works really well and you just throw things together and it comes out the other end and boom, it's done. You know, like, you know, and so, so, you know, I, I still would recommend um, the first editing platform until you know you need Resolve. I still would say that the, we're going to teach a lot of people Resolve because I think that we, we as a group need to understand it. Uh, Facebook is now, or I'm sorry, not Facebook, but YouTube is now supporting HDR. You know, we're going to see a lot more vision. We're going to see a lot more other things that are that are out there. And so I think it's important for us to really understand the finer parts of Resolve as a group professionally. But if I was doing if I was doing corporate edits or educational edits or fast co commercial edits um, that aren't as technical as what, you know, full HDR with surround or whatever, I'd probably still use Final Cut for it. Um, and Final Cut could catch up to those things that, that Resolve's doing. But I just think it's a lot faster and a lot easier to learn, especially if you come out of iMovie. Um, Anyway, that's my opinion. So someone else is raising their hand. Next question. Um, Gabriel 
Ung of Malaysia, is there a way to get past the whole list of camera options? A Decklink Duo 2 lists under Zoom camera settings. It flows right to the bottom of the screen, and I can't scroll down to reach my virtual camera. He's frustrated. He says, thanks. <laughs> you need a... You need a... Here's what I found: you need a monitor with a higher resolution. No, that, like that's the only fix I found for that. That is so. The problem that he's having is is that uh, if you use a deck link or a or a or a mini uh, the the um, mini recorder or whatever, you get all the options that would be possible for for Black Magic from um, and and that sometimes can scroll. If the resolution on your screen's high enough, you'll be able to, and you make it small enough, you'll be able to get to what you're trying to get to. But I, I haven't found another fix. Um, that's a, it's a bug. I don't know where, I don't know whose bug it is. It's, it's, you know, Black Magic's giving you all the options, and and uh, the, uh, uh, and Zoom isn't trying to limit your options. I don't know where that falls in, in how to, and so that as a result, I don't know how to fix it other than higher resolution monitor. Um, next question. Michael J. in New York City asks, Hi, Alex, need to clean up the audio from an MP4 file. What's the best method to export and then import the audio file? I mean, I think that AIFF or WAVE or, you know, like it just you're just getting into some package that you can work with. Um, I don't, you know, when you're promoting it to a higher, to a larger file, it's not going to help you other than giving you headroom uh, to work. But once you bring it into most editors, they're going to, have some kind of something they're working with there. I mean, I don't know if Mickey wants to jump in on that. Go ahead. Yeah, if you have access to, if you still have access to a QuickTime Pro, a very simple way to do that in a QuickTime Pro with uh, good results. Um, I know what the a lot of people in the panel feel about um, about uh, Adobe Media Encoder, but that will also get the job done. Um, and also Shutter Encoder um, for Mac, it's a free tool and it also works well. Next question. Um, Ken Jones of Seattle says, ask Mickey how he arranges Yulene to show the big digital numbers on his level meter. Uh, big digital numbers, okay. Uh, so that this is essentially, I'm using OBS to just crop out the the, uh, short-term loudness from WLM because it's a more legible uh, meter. So I just stuck that on top of Yulene so people <laughs> so can see it while, is, while it's in the This is the WLM Yulene merger uh, together. He's done a mashup. It's a pastiche. A video mashup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I will admit that I, I I like the overall look. It looks like I'm coming in a little high, so I'm going to bring it down. Uh, I didn't do my mic check when I came in. Um so I like the I like the the Yulene look uh, overall, but I will say that I I find it harder to glance down and read while I'm to to, to Mickey's point, and even the 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 overall layout of this is harder for me to deal with than than what we had before as far as like a glance. Um, I don't know exactly why. I might get used to it. Um, yeah, anyway. it it's definitely there are more things on screen as opposed to WLM, which is you know here are your mm -hmm. figures, here are your numbers, uh, get the job done. Um, but for me, uh, the whole, because Yulene seems to be uh, not as uh, efficiently written, it's quite a resource hog. Um, I don't think I'll be keeping it. Oh, there you go. Um, next question. We're going to burn through these questions in like 30 seconds each because they're, they're, uh, we're, we're going to get, we're going to move over to the subject matter. So next question. Scott Ryder, Perth, Australia. From watching a few Zoom videos and other streams, is software moving to be less fiddly? So once you get your settings perfect, they are saved and you don't need to keep making adjustments. I haven't gotten to that point in Zoom yet. <laughs> I feel like I'm fiddling with it constantly. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, and we do a lot of this and just, lots of little things. I, I tweeted something out about this because I was, I was noticing it yesterday that I was like, when you get good at fixing things, you just get better. You, it's okay to break them because you know how to put them back together. And I think that, that there is a certain level of just allowing things to just have to adjust it. I think there's a danger in having things just set and forget because then you are afraid to change anything. And so you don't, you don't constantly evolve because you're like, oh, I don't want to change that box. And I have found that when I get outside of that, where I'm no longer afraid of the application or afraid of the hardware or afraid of something else. And I know that I can just do whatever I need to do with it. I evolve faster as a, as an artist, as a, you know, as in production, whatever that is, I evolve faster because I'm not afraid of pulling it apart. Um, but what that does mean is that until I understand it, there's a lot of stress. So anyway, next question. 
Moving on to Mark Harder of Brooklyn. I'm in. I'm demoing a free Google Room. When I fire it up, it completely takes over that machine, and I can only remotely switch video inputs. But I can't get at any other controls. Can't fire up OBS, PowerPoint. Is that a free version limitation, or am I missing something? I think that's the design of a Google Room. I think it's the design of rooms in general. Is that you're, they're expecting you to come in somewhere else with those other things, and I'm expecting you to use the same computer for the room to do the, to do all the other things that you want to do. Um, it's designing to be kind of a, here's a platform that is your pr presentation. Um, I think zoom rooms are similar in that, in that sense that they're kind of designed to be the thing that everything connects to, but not necessarily, you're not, they're not designed to do multiple things at one time. Um, next question. Uh, Tom Weinland of San Francisco says, hi, a friend of mine lives in Santa Rosa, California, and he wants to get local TV channels. He tried an antenna, but it didn't work very well. Any ideas on how to get local TV channels? I use Locast, the Locast app here in San Francisco, but it's not available in Santa Rosa yet. I guess I would say local and free, because um, the easiest way to get local channels is tv.youtube.com, you know, but it's 70 bucks a month, and then you have local channels. Uh, most of the local channels that you want, along with a lot of other channels. Uh, anyone who wants to do research for broadcast, the only reason I have it, I don't watch enough live TV to care about it, but the only reason I have it is specifically because I use it for research. I, I follow every show that I'm remotely interested in. You hit plus on everything and it just constantly is saving, you know, your, your collections. And then I can go through and say, I, I want to, what are lower thirds looking like today across all the live shows? And I can do that in a couple hours. I can just gather everything that's being done all over the world, um, you know, and just look at how lower thirds are being designed and how, to, how are super sources and how are opens and sweepers. And you, know, you can just collect those. Um, it's something I'm planning to do more of next year is, is one of our like Mondays and so on and so forth is we're just going to look at what people are doing, you know, as a, as kind of a research project, but that's where I'm going to grab it all from uh, Bill. And then, and then Paul. Yeah, your broadcast reception is always going to be relative to how the tower that's doing that broadcast is installed. And some houses just can't get it. And that's the way it is. Um, most cable companies, and this is a paid, but even the lowest package, they wrote must carry into the local stations for a lot of those early cable companies. So if you get the cheapest possible cable from the cheapest possible source, you should get the local back, but it's not free. Thank you, Mitt. I was trying to think about while we were answering this, like when was I the last time I looked, watched a local station, I think is the hard part is that I don't, I don't watch TV that much anyway. So, but, but it's even then local, I find even just something I don't do very often. Uh, go ahead, Leland. Uh, over the top solution would be a Roku or a Sling TV. Those will also give you the mm -hmm. option through your local cable provider. Obviously you have to have an ISP, but you can access all kinds of apps for local television. That yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I've got a pretty good size house out here and uh, I've wired every room with cab you know, cable going to the rooftop with a beam antenna, TV antenna. But even in Austin where I have a condo on the 10th floor, I got one of these pretty good Amazon deals on uh, over the air antenna and I, I hit the auto tune. Man, I was astounded at the number of channels that I got, things that I've never even heard of before it's amazing what's out there over the air right now and, and you just have to also decide how much of your yard you want to use or how much of your roof you want to use uh, i built an array on my roof i think i talked about this a couple of days ago uh, to my parents chagrin um with with um uh electric uh fence <laughs> you know, <the> wire <laughs> and it worked i couldn't get it. the steeler games came in much clearer after i was done but we lived in the middle of nowhere and uh, it did take a an afternoon and a bit of work with lots of little poles and things like that. And there's a lot of good, you can, there's a lot of good resources on the internet about the actual structure of the antenna and direction and so on and so forth. But the bigger the antenna, the more you can pick up and you just have to kind of start, you know, getting into a structure that I can pull it. So the one that I built on my parents' roof, that can give you a sense of it. It was not like a little three by three. I think it was probably uh, 25 feet wide and 10 or 15 feet high. <laughs> like it was, it was a thing, you know, like it was, you know, and, and, it, and it, it did improve the, the, the quality of the, of the reception. Um, anyway, it so makes some uh, nice directional attic antennas now too, that are yeah. huge, you know, framework that'll hidden. They're not back then we couldn't find them on the internet. So you couldn't, you couldn't find anything. So it was just, you just figure it out. You bought a book on antennas and then you figure out what needs to be. And then you start structuring it and running around putting it together, but you, it's, it's a fun little project actually is building antennas. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. 
And one thing I just might mention, a lot of the over-the-top solutions don't give you the sub-channels, which are sometimes the more interesting channels, which are the, you know, like 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. The broadcast antenna can give you, uh, you know, they'll be available, you know, the primary channel will be available yep. over the top, but not the sub-channels. So yep. keep that in mind. Yep, absolutely. All right, we're shifting gears to the second hour. So we've talked about being a freelancer. We've talked about uh, being a... Um, being a freelancer, being a producer, but we haven't really talked a lot about just how to get in. Like how, how do you actually start doing media production? Because I think a lot of people, like they have ideas, they, they, they're sitting here at, in office hours and they're trying to figure out, okay, so what's next? Like, how do you do it? So what I thought we would talk about a little bit is how maybe share a little bit. Well, first answer some questions. We've got a couple of questions. And if you've got questions about how to get in, this is the right time to ask. Um, we ran a little, we didn't have a ton of questions. So I went ahead and ran a little heavy um, on the, uh, on the first hour, but now is your chance to ask questions if you have them around how to get into the industry. And, um, if you have, uh, some, any specific tips, if our panelists have tips, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, while I'm waiting for the people to raise their hand, I'll tell a little bit of a couple ways that I've gotten in. Um, mostly the way I got into almost everything was either getting paid very little or nothing, you know, just be flat out. I mean, people are trying to go to, I didn't go to school for any of thing, the things that I did. So I didn't have any degree. I didn't have any, whatever. I had to prove my way into it. Uh, my first job in the, in the kind of the entertainment industry was walking into an alternative rock station and saying, I love alternative rock and I'll sweep the floors for free. Like literally that's, that's what came out of my mouth. I thought about it all the way while I was driving. Like, how do I make it really, really short? And, you know, for a little radio station, someone, some kid that, We'll sweep the floors for free is good. Now, then I worked like they paid me a hundred bucks an hour. That's the other key is you never work like you're doing them a favor or you're an intern or whatever. You know, I swept the floors and then I reorganized the entire library so that it was more efficient. And then I wrote an application that ran the, ran the radio station. And then I, <laughs> yeah, and then, and then they, they said, Oh, you have a nice voice. Do you want to do a, a, a weekend? You know, do you want to do a, a, com a commercial? So I did one commercial uh, that I wasn't getting paid for. Um, and I worked on it for two days <laughs> for 30 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, to try to get it right. Cause I'd never done one before. So I had to figure out how to do it. Um, but I had a little sound studio, um, and with carpet on the side, it was very cheap. Anyway, uh, then I started doing commercials and I started actually getting paid for them. And then, then I started doing the Saturday morning show. Uh, and then I, before you knew it, I was doing the morning, morning show. <laughs> and then I was a music director. Then I was program director uh, or assistant program director. And, um, and it was a great experience, but, but the point is, is that I worked and I did all, all of that happened in, you know, year and a half, two years. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, what I'm always looking for is where do I get in? You know, like, where's the wedge, you know, and I'm always working on the things that I'm interested in doing. Um, I don't know how they're going to pay for themselves. I just know that I like them. And then, and then, you know, if you work hard at it, that things pop out the other end. I always am worried about how to make money. So I figure out how to pay the bills. And then I go back to what I was doing, which is trying to figure out what I love to do. And how do I do more of that until it's taken over my, you know, take taken over. Um, go ahead, Sky, and then Alex. Well, again, very similar in the, in the asking of questions is, is it art or is it a, is it a job or can it be both? How do you survive? Well, I think that, well and, the one thing I want to say about that though, is that yeah, please. when you look at Da Vinci and you look at, at, at uh, Mark, M Michelangelo Picasso. and all of them, they were all paid to do those things. Like there's very yeah. few, very little of that work that they did for free. They were work for hire. <laughs> like these, these, these incredible exactly. things where someone hired them to go do that, you know, and the Mona Lisa was probably like, Oh my gosh, I, uh, you know, like, like, you know, and you know, the, you know, and, 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 but well, it's, they were, but they we have to remember that wedding photographers. Yeah. So, so it's not, we want to make sure that we're clear. Now, some of them produced, some of them that were wealthy might've produced it, or they had a patron that paid for them to, to do their go. thing. But, but a huge amount of artwork that we consider classic uh, was done for hire. You know, like just someone asked them to, to do the Sistine Chapel or do the whatever. Now they got good at it, but it was all still, they got hired to do it. And the, the goal is to your points, guys, to get hired to do what you love to do, but you do have to, I consider what I do more of a craft than an art because I want to keep my focus on that. Go ahead, Sky. Well, and then the other question is, is it a product or a service? And that's where as a freelancer, I was working in somebody else's environment and I was providing a service for them. But now I've shifted my life from being an editor 
to being a content creator as a producer. And so mm -hmm. now I'm providing a, a, a piece of content. Now, where is it distributed? How is it distributed? Who's paying for it? These are all the flexibilities, but we're now in a land of no longer the conduits of distribution are in New York and LA. They're at the end of your phone mm -hmm. and you can now be a producer, but you gotta be, you gotta understand story. You gotta understand mm -hmm. what is your audience want? Uh, Alex and so then that's Marty. This. Yep, Alex and then Marty. Uh, can't hear you, Alex. Uh, Alex, we can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear us. Can you guys hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, you just can't hear Alex. Alex, we can't hear you. I don't know if we, I don't, oh, maybe his headset's off. So, Alex, Alex. Is it those new uh, new headsets again? Okay, we can't hear you. Yeah, maybe maybe it paired with the the, air, the maybe it paired with the. Okay, X. okay, we we have a technical <laughs> issue there. Okay, great, uh, Marty. It's a cheap Apple headset again. Go ahead, Marty. So people uh, try to enter the business at different points in their lives. So depending on where you are, if you're younger and you know of university age, uh, volunteering at the uh, the radio radio or TV stations at your uh, university is a great way to um, be able to experience what happens in video production and to get in there and learn at a relatively uh, low risk environment. If you're out of university and um, trying to find a way to uh, find people in the, in the environment, in the business, look for uh, professional organizations like in Washington DC here, there's the um, ITVA, uh, International uh, Television Video Association, not, and, and there's also Women in Film and Video. These are nonprofit groups of uh, local professionals that hold monthly meetings and have um, uh, discussion groups online. And it's a great way to meet and network with people uh, and, and to talk with people and find out what they're doing and who needs what and, and find a potential um, uh, ways to, to work with other people and internships. Internships is another great opportunity. I mean, there's, there's nothing that will ever replace doing it. So you just have to find places where people will let you do it, is, 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 is in my opinion, um, uh, to get started. Leland and then Bill. I want to second what Marty just said, because this one who in high school spent two years in radio and television broadcasting live to the alumni, that took my first step into public broadcasting at the local television station, which was basically your uh, public access cable network. So do go check in if you have a local cable television uh, network in your area, go talk to them. They usually have a studio available for public use, including equipment, cameras, editing equipment, you name it. Um, other than that, Spex Howard School of Broadcasting is another place to check into. They have very uh, limited internship degrees that you can get from them for uh, certifications in audio and video broadcasting. So something else to look into and, as well. Then hopefully they get you contacts because the certification doesn't mean anything to anyone. Like yeah. just, I mean, we all need to know that like that piece of paper is worthless. So it's the, um, training, though. Yeah, the, the, it's the, the training, the training and, and learning it and figuring it out. But there's no certification that I've seen in our industry that anyone actually looks for. Um, you know, that in, at least in what I've worked on in the last 15 years, it's just who you know and, and what your reputation is and how you worked on it. Um, you know, I guess they, the piece of paper meant something at some point, but I don't know when. Um, Bill and then Courtney. So for me, there has been two things that have been critical through the course of my life. The first thing is preparing myself to be useful in whatever field it was. And that might be paying somebody in a school situation. It may be obsessively reading and studying on my own. It may have been hanging out with groups that were uh, ad hoc groups to learn it, but it was preparing myself so that when the opportunity opens up, you can do something useful consistently. Then the second part of, I think, is just as important. It was for me understanding that companies don't hire people. People hire people. And you have to make yourself the kind of person that they're interested in hiring. And Alex talks a lot about those soft skills of you don't walk in and tell them how to do their job. You walk in and listen. You hope that you can understand the culture and the people. And you can do things like making sure that if you say you're going to be there Tuesday at seven o'clock in the morning, you are there 
Tuesday morning at 645 in the morning, waiting for them to show up to be able to give you the chance. So if you do those two things, prepare yourself and then connect with people who can hire you, that's your best chance of I mean, getting into the industry. When you're really good, you can be pretty much, you can do whatever you want, right? Uh, you know, like really people who are really good can be very really quirky. They can do all, they can have all kinds of weird things that they, ways that they approach things. When you're getting started, just don't be weird. Like don't any, any part of weirdness. Don't be like, like, you know, when you're trying to get into an industry, you just try to be aerodynamic, you know, <laughs> and, and, and if you, and, and, you know, how you wear your hair and how much tats you show and what you talk about on set, all of those things make you less aerodynamic. You know, as far as going, going, you know, going into the, into the thing is just, it just flips up all this stuff, you know? And, and the thing is, is that, you know, we have, you know, what you want to do is you want to be, you know, there, you want to be useful to, to bills. You want to be helpful. You want to be, a, you know, and, and you don't want to have any opinions. Like when you get started, like, you know, you don't like just stop, you know, especially about politics or about, you know, Bitcoin. <laughs> this was a recent problem that I had, you know, the guy is just constantly talking about Bitcoin and he was like incredibly talented person that just couldn't stop talking about Bitcoin. And I was like, I don't think I can have him back on set, you know, like, and, or, or even cars, you know, like, you know, like the thing is, is like, don't in here's the, here's the thing when you're really good, people will, will do it, but you just have to understand that producers are listening to everything. Whoever you're working with is listening to everything. And so, you know, outside when you're having lunch fine to talk about cars or talk about whatever you want to talk about uh, well not whatever but uh when you're in the work area just keep your mouth shut like if you're asking about cameras or if you're asking about something like that just just do that you know and and you're better off otherwise just not saying anything uh and and again once you get really good you can kind of shoot your mouth off you can do a bunch of other things but man you got to be good uh and the more you can just be quiet and get your job done and only and and still ask questions when you need to don't do stupid things uh, it's amazing how quickly we latch on to people I, I just know when i hire people you know we just hired some pas and they were great and you know what it wasn't very complicated go get the lunch go do this go do a do a sync check do this did, 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 did person every time i said his name he was there and then when he went up to the stage did exactly what i did and every time i asked him to do stuff he did it with just a little more and with never any attitude and never any process and yes it's you know made it easy you know what i was like we're gonna use that guy all the time <laughs> you know and if he does something else if i find out that oh he actually is getting into cameras or whatever i might let him play with a camera you know on during breaks and i might let him because he's interested in it because i already know the most important thing is that he's a good team player and he works hard. Like, okay, so that's the hardest part for me to find as a producer. Team player works hard. Fig you prove that part and you'll get all kinds of little chances to do other things. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, everybody's pretty much covered most of the high points there and I agree with almost all of them. The, the uh, uh, In Hollywood and, the, and in, in a lot of the industry, it's who you know, not necessarily what you know, although you have to know how to do your job. But, you know, if you're extremely competent in all areas uh, but you don't meet the right people you'll never get in so it's being at the right place at the right time when somebody needs somebody and having the skills to carry out that job and as Alex said too uh, when you're working as an you know coming in as an apprentice or under someone you know typically most most jobs in the set uh, you know have a a department head and they hire all the people under they're responsible for hiring all the people or, or at least turning in a list of names to the producer of all the people they want to work with under them so those are the people you want to court for a job and but don't be don't be a don't pest court them. Yeah, it's, it's a the, very very the fine way, line the you way you court someone the way you court yeah. someone is to is to be really good at it you know, like be right. really good at what you do exactly. and and be really you know like uh the the thing that we're all we're all working in an imperfect situation. You know, production is, is a constant state of imperfectness, right? So you're just trying to figure it all out until you've done it 20 times or 30 times or 100 times. It's all like you're just figuring it out and these files didn't come in the right way and this wasn't named the right way or this wasn't set up the right way or, or the camera's in the wrong place and all that stuff. And, and you're always figuring it out. What makes clients uncomfortable is people constantly telling them how screwed up it is. You know, this is totally screwed up or whatever. Da, 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 da. What people love is, hey, I got an idea. 
what if we did this or how do we do this and everything's fine and we're just going to figure it out and everything else. And when you have people just constantly figuring it out and, and on your team to do that, um, it is, uh, you know, you just get called back. I'm no, going okay, go ahead, Alex and Marty and Mickey. So I think and then um, Jesse. people who, if you want to get into any industry, including this industry, the people in the industry are looking for people who are one of us. Now, how do you get to be one of us? Well, you have to have the right attitude. You have to know stuff. You have to have the ability to do it. But also, to some extent, you have to be ready to see the world from their point of view, to have their concerns, or at least know what their concerns are. I was once at an actor's party, 99% actors, but I had to talk to a film producer. And after half an hour, he asked me, Alex, what do you tell people about how to get into the film industry? What answer do you give? Because I always have that problem as a, as a film producer. And I said, well you, well, you think I'm a film producer, but I'm a graphic designer. It's just that I know enough about your world that I can talk to you as if I am already a film producer and I have your concerns and know what's going on in your world. And that's the answer. Mm -hmm. There's enough information out there from, you know, online journals, conversations to actually realize what are they all talking about with each other? And then what that means is you're now one of them. And people like to give work to people who are like one of them, as opposed to having to give work to people who don't know what's really quote going on in their world yep yep i right, go ahead marty so one of the uh, more difficult things that new people try just entering the industry um find learning is that um, while this is a creative craft and art it's also a business and if you're going to once you're out of the intern and volunteer stage and you start to go out on your own you really need to pay attention to the business side of the of of what you do. Um, I have I have talked to people who uh, went out and did jobs and hadn't thought about how I'm going to send invoices. Right? You have to. They they were they were doing this on a gentleman's agreement that they were going to get paid um, without having the conversation. So. You have to have an accounting system. You have to be able to send invoices. You have to be able to talk with people who are um, the, the uh, accountants in, in your client's office who are going to pay you. So it's really a business. And then after that, once you, one of the things that I love about doing production is that it's, it's a collaborative craft um, where you will be running into a lot of the same people, date after date after date, show after show after show, production after production. And there's people in all, there's camera people, sound people, grip people, lighting people, and it's a community. You will find that there is a real community environment. And with community, there has to be, um, you know, there are, are personalities and, and there are temperaments. And um, one of the things that I uh, always stuck with me um, I'm going to quote Ed Norton of um, uh, the Honeymooners fame. Ed Norton was a sewer worker, and he always used to say, be kind to the people you meet on the way up the ladder, because you're going to meet those same people on your way down. <laughs> well, and, and, and also, those, you may meet those in, the next, in, in another part. You know, they, everybody's moving up the ladder, theoretically, and... The other thing to remember as you get going is when you get started, you're trying to help people that are in front of you, move them, have them move up the ladder because you'll be, you know, maybe in their wake, you know, like, you know, and, uh, uh, and then once you get forward, you're trying to help everyone behind you because someone who becomes successful behind you is someone now that is one of your friends, you know, that, that's there that you helped do something there, especially when you're not busy, like when you're busy, you know, uh, you stop doing a lot of favors when the, one of the biggest places that a lot of people that I know get work is because when their friends are going, I'm going to go shoot something over the weekend for fun. Like I got a test to do. I got a thing to do. I'm playing with an idea. The, the, those are good things to show up for. <laughs> like, like those are, those are really good things to be part of, of. I got, I got something fun. I want to do those are that that's where you build bonds with a bunch of people that when someone says, Hey, you know, I'm looking for somebody, you know, I'm looking for a PA or I'm looking for a, ca a camera assist or I'm looking for a, a two, you know, if you've been playing around on weekends with them and, and working on stuff where you showed up for, for nothing, 
holy smokes, you know, that you become part of that community that's there. Now, I don't think you should do a bunch of things that people are doing commercial work on and doing it for free or anything else. But I'm just saying doing stuff with your friends, A, gives you a place to play, you know, where, where things are, you know, you making mistakes don't have the same level of, of impact, um, you know, and, and B, it, it gives them a, uh, a, it lets you build community. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. Um, I think, I just want to second what Alex mentioned earlier, this uh, hard work and you have to deliver hard work, not just for the sake of working hard, but, you know, making things more efficient, helping people, other people and what they're doing. And of course you have to deliver like back then um, when I was still mostly in the camera department, I was, I was a second AC for a long while and I wanted to shift over to doing sound. Uh, my first ever uh, full-time job in the industry was uh as an intern in a post-production house. And they promised me that they would get me into the sound department, but they had me doing menial office work, you know, what an intern does, building, building, uh, helping build workflow Bibles for shows and also, you know, ordering a toner for the laser, laser printers <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, right. And then after my first six, six or 12 months there, I, like, I, I asked them like, what, what, I thought you were gonna put me into sound. So they said like, okay, you work on what you're doing now. And then at the same time, do some work for sound. And I was delivering for both the menial office tasks and also sound. I was doing like, you know, 20 hour days for two different departments. And like after a while it paid off and they, they got me doing post sound under Greg. And, and I would say being reliable is a big deal. You know, like someone might give you an intern position and then you don't, you're not reliable. And then they just go, well, I can't lean on that. So they, then you never get a chance to go into what you wanted to do. And the reason they're not putting you there is because they don't think that they can actually lean on you. And, and that's a, that's a key piece of the puzzle. Um, go ahead, uh, Jesse, and then Chris, and then Sky, and then we'll, and then we're going to move into questions. Thanks. Yeah. Just two quick points. Uh, one of which is being sort of a constructive problem solver uh, when the mm -hmm. time is appropriate for those sort of things, rather than, you know, airing out your uh, grievances during during a production. The other would be uh, just effective and concise communication with producers because they're juggling so many things and, and under a lot of pressure. So if you can really get, you know, I need to find this and that and whatever, or this sort of delivered, or and just get that information to them, uh, you know, quickly and and seamlessly, then you'll be able to, uh, you know, get what you need to get, you know, done because everybody's yeah. under this uh, speed and sort of a uh, scope of big scopes of projects uh, nowadays. So yep. yeah. I go ahead, Chris. Uh, I, this is slightly off topic, but I've never been so happy that we had 1080 on this show as when we go to Marty's shot and looking at that impressive array of gear on the shelves behind him, <laughs> I'm completely enthralled by it. That's all. No, that's great. That's great. All right. Uh, go ahead, Sky. The, the definition of luck that I use is the merging of planning and opportunity and to Mickey's point of having an opportunity and then jumping on it and using your imagination to allow yourself to be given permission to try something and then just working really hard it reminds me of a cartoon, the Dilbert, where the manager comes up to Dilbert and says, I've got this idea. And the Dilbert's response is, yeah, we call that, we have a technical term for that. And that's called nothing. <laughs> uh, next question. Okay, actually, the first one we've dealt with in this thing, it comes from TJ Asher in Minneapolis here. And on the panel, if a director works with the actors and the cinematographer films the movie, just what does the producer do? And it depends is not an acceptable answer. <laughs> well, it does depend on it does depend on what what the, what kind of producer and, and what, what role they're they're putting. You had Courtney and then Mickey. Yeah, it's become such a, a quandary that even the Producers Guild doesn't know what a producer does. Because right. They have to classify the 50 or 60 people that are applying for that credit on every every motion picture. There's The primary uh, job for a producer is to, uh, the real producer, is to put together the crew and the, the elements, and sometimes they'll start off even putting together the creative uh, team, licensing their rights to the project, uh, putting together, putting attaching a director to the project, and then from there uh, uh, casting and then putting together the crew and the producer. All that stuff goes through the producer and he approves all that stuff. Then there are the 
also around producers, which are sometimes given the label of executive producer, and a lot of those are just contractual titles that are, are achieved just to get that particular person money because they can't get it through a standard mm -hmm. union contract or so on. So uh, you got to be careful. you got to know when someone says they're an associate producer, you don't know what they really do. Yeah, you don't, you don't really know. And, and for us, you know, we have producers and then we have technical producers. And generally for us internally, a producer is someone who's handling all the logistics. So they're really handling when, you know, they're overseeing the hotel, you know, the, not personally, but over, they're accountable for the hotels and the food and the crew and, the, and you know, uh, working out all the, the legal things and the NDAs and the COVID, you know, requirements and the, you know, all that stuff. They're managing all of that. Uh, the technical producer is managing kind of the, the technical logistics of what what equipment do we need and and you know what kind of operators and, and so on and so forth. So those are where we see those get split up. Go ahead, Mickey, and then Bill, and we'll move pretty quickly because yeah. we've got a couple questions and not a lot of. It time. varies from production to production, and this may be skewed towards say the the narrative side of things. Um, a producer is generally speaking in charge of getting the show produced. Everything from from the start, like getting financing, all the way down to distribution. Um, that is the purview of the producer. And within that is also, as Alex, Alex mentioned, like logistics, you know, uh, transportation, locations and all that. So every department's problem is also the producer's problem. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, essentially getting the thing produced as producer's mm -hmm. purview. Go ahead, Bill. On a small news career or something like that, that you find producers, particularly in news and things like that, that are actually not very high up the totem pole. On a movie or something like that, the producer theoretically is at the top of the totem pole, maybe other than the investor group or the corporation funding things. A CEO, I once asked him, you know, what what is what do you consider the top? What are your responsibilities? And he said, basically, it's the more responsibility you take for the efforts of others to achieve results is the real definition of that kind of responsibility. And the reason that producers up at the top get massive amounts of this is they would take responsibility for an incredibly complex stream of effort of other people. So basically a really good producer is going to watch out for everybody downstream and make their lives easier and get the job done. Yeah. Very good. Um, uh, next question. Moving on to Robert Laney of Las Vegas, getting commercial liability insurance CL that's oriented to our industry with a minimum of $1 million of occurrence and a $2 million aggregate. You might need higher coverages. He's talking about uh, how producers, I think, are yeah, as, far how, as, how as far as breaking into the industry, I wouldn't worry about that yet. Um, you're probably going to be, you know, if you're breaking in, what I will say is that for the most part, you're going to be um, doing smaller jobs where you don't need that. I, what I will say is that in, in states like California, in general, but in states like California, um, you need to have an LLC or a S Corp, C Corp, something like that. Um, that's kind of become the new requirement because of AB5. Um, and so, uh, for instance, as we go into 2000, I know that it's not a requirement for everyone, but it's going to be coming more of that issue. So, for instance, um, for us going to 2021, we had to take people on as employees when we, they're working for us for three days because you know, our legislators are idiots. So um, the uh, so the um, uh, not that I'm bitter. It, it's just something that I have to deal with all all day. You know, like it, it is like a constant conversation because they were trying to do something that they couldn't do in the first place. And so uh, as a result, next year people will either. Uh, be a LLC, a S Corp, C Corp, or they'll, we will push them through a payroll, which means it will cost them 15% of the, we're not going to pay them more. It's not our problem if they didn't do that. So um, we're going to say, you know, if it's $600 a day or $800 a day, we're paying you that, but we're going to pay it to a payroll service and they're going to pay you, you know, and if so, so you can't do 1099 in California anymore. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so you, 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 I would worry about, you know, setting that up. It makes it a lot easier for, you, for us to work with you. Um, in general, if you're in California to do that. Um, go ahead, Courtney. Another thing, uh, insurance-wise, you have to remember, even if you are an S Corp or C Corp, if you have employees that are you're paying uh, through payroll service or whatever, you have to carry workers' comp insurance on them. Yep. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of things once you start a business and start having employees. When we're talking about cracking into the business, I'm kind of going, exactly. you know, you're a single person trying to just get into it, get, get a little bit of work. But, but they won't even, right. I, I have, you know, I sub, I'm a subcontractor on almost every job we do. And mm -hmm. 
most of them will not hire you. They will either say, well, you have to work as an employee for us, or you have to have proof of workers' compensation insurance for your employees because mm -hmm. otherwise they will not even hire you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's the, I mean, you, you do, we probably need to build a whole second hour on the business of things. You know, um, you know, we were kind of doing the operational, like these are little things to do to get in, but you're right that there's a whole business end of things which Robert Laney has laid out a couple things as well as, um, as uh, other folks. So um, next, next question. Moving on to Kyle Hammond in Chicago, who asked a more general question. I usually have multiple projects in process at the same time. What's your best method for keeping track of hours per project? And one thing that I want to say, last thing about the insurance, by the way, is that you can get it for the day or get it for a week. You don't have to keep it on, you don't have to buy insurance for a year. You can, there are people who provide that service for you. So you can, it costs a little bit more per unit than you'd pay. And if you're doing it all the time, you don't, you would want that, but you can, as you get started, use it as a per unit um, uh, cost. So go ahead. Who, who, what do people use to keep track of their time? Does anyone have any um, specific? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I've mentioned it before in the past. We use an app called um, Harvest. It's harvestapp.com. Uh, there's a web version. There's a phone version. You, it keeps track of, you, you start and stop. You can edit if you need to fudge something. They send you gentle little emails at 10 o'clock at night. Hey, did you mean to check out? Have you gone home yet? So, you know, you can adjust stuff, but on the back end, the office has the ability to search by any job. You can budget the amount of hours that are supposed to be spent mm -hmm. on the job and they can compare it. It's it's pretty cool. It's a little costy, but it it's saves so much time in the in the long run. Next question. Moving on to Jim E of Louisville, and Jim asks, for a small but quality one hour video, what are the essential positions needed? As Mickey would say. It depends. It depends. <laughs> it's like, like there's so many things. I have a, you know, I'm doing a, a, you know, for a video, I mean, obviously you need a, what I would say if you're shooting, when we send out someone for a shoot, there are four people that we typically have on, a, on, on the case. Um, we may go with low, less, but there's generally a, some kind of producer or coordinator, right? There's a PA, there's a camera operator, and there's a sound, you know, a sound engineer, like a field, field sound. That's a great little group of people as a minimum that run out. People often underestimate the power of a PA. Uh, you know, a, you know, it's uh, producer, you know, it, 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 they are the, you know, the, the lubrication of the entire, you know, event, <laughs> the whole system is your, your PAs and your, and you know, they, you know, you, they make everything work and, you know, paying your camera operator to figure something out that a PA could have is nuts it breaks their, their concentration. It breaks those other things. And so, so you want to think about that. It's something that a lot of people will cut out first. And that's oftentimes something that really makes the production much harder. Um, and then the other thing is, is that it's hard to do camera and audio at the same time and do them both. Well, especially what happens is you get great camera, you give the camera operator a, a audio, they, you know, you just don't get as good audio <laughs> like, because they don't know how to do that. Um, uh, and then, you know, and, and, and vice versa you know, to some degree, and then a producer is just someone who's kind of overall paying attention to things and making sure that you get things done on time and you didn't forget something. And now those, those, the size of those crews get much bigger. I mean, we have, you know, the shoots we're doing right now, you know, we've got a remote system, but I've got like, we've got like eight people on zoom, like that are all accountable for some different part of the shoot um, that, that's managing, you know, managing those things. So it can get much bigger, even on small projects. Go ahead, Bill. I have pared down to the smallest group that I have ever worked with during this COVID period. And we probably shot half a dozen um, corporate things in here. And I now break it down into a content person, a technical person, and a people person. And I'm lucky because I've been at this for such a long time and I came out of sound into visual and I did lighting and the rest of that. I can do most of the technical things myself. It's hard work and I would be happier if I was 30 years old doing this than to the point, but I can go and set up a camera. I can set up sound. I can set up lighting. I can get a good shot and I can come up with a very acceptable result. I cannot do that and pay attention to the people on the set. And so a people person is the human being who is interfacing with the, uh, with everybody in the corporation that I'm working for who wants us to do something. She or he is 
veiling that from me so I don't get distracted. And then the content person has to be somebody from that organization who has the ear of either the CEO or the manager, whoever is in charge of this work for them, who has to be the final arbiter of what is going to go into the program. I cannot work without those three people. Anything else I can is optional, but I would love help in any one of those areas when I can find it. Go ahead, Marty, and then Chris. So Alex, I wanted to just answer your question about how uh, what we use to keep track of time. Um, I'm on Android and I've been using an app called Expense Manager. And the author is, uh, or it's built by B-L-U-J-I-T, Bluejit. And this keeps track of my, it has a running uh, clock. So when I start a job, I can start it. Uh, it keeps track of my uh, travel expenses. And um, one of the cool things about it is that you set up your clients and then you set up your jobs for each of those clients. And then it keeps track of everything. It'll keep track of um, that you need. So, and then it, it can produce these reports that you can either email yourself or it'll automatically send it to Dropbox that is a project reports or job reports or anything else that you need. It, it's a fabulous, fabulous That's great. app. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Chris? I was going to say, uh, kind of bouncing off of what Bill was talking about, about the different people you need on a, on a set. One of the things I found has been very interesting during COVID when we're doing interviews and stuff, because the interviews we're doing are you know, just another Zoom meeting, we're actually getting better input from the client because it's easier for them to just open up a Zoom window as opposed to drive across town to be part of a studio shoot. So, you know, we have the producers and directors and subject matter experts. Quite often we can have somebody from the legal team sit in and make sure nobody's saying anything wrong. And we're actually ended up, we're kind of getting better content because of it. Yeah, I, I don't think I could go back. Like all these shoots now that we're doing, we just did one, you know, I did, did one this morning in Paris <laughs> with, with people all over the world watching and, and interacting and figuring all this stuff out. And it is just, it's so great because every, all the decision makers are sitting watching it. And so then there's this text going back and forth and discussions about, oh, let's change this and move this around. And there's no like, oh, we should have thought of that on set. We don't have to. And, and the thing is, is it's totally scalable. Like it obviously can get out of hand, but the main thing is everyone kind of knows not to talk a lot during the show. All the people that we're going to complain about it later are there and, and signing off on it and making it work in real time. So great. So great. I mean, like I just, you know, and we talked about wanting to do that for a long time. And I think that this has broken that wall. I think a lot of producers don't like it or directors don't like it because they don't like being second guessed while they're working. Um, but I think that it's going to be a part of many productions you know, you're gonna get second so. guessed anyway you may as well get it out of the yeah. way yeah, you know otherwise it's just gonna be a, a second guess a bad yeah, exactly. a bad pass through post if you don't get the right yeah. stuff shot anyway so i think we're i have a hard hard out today um and so we're gonna we're gonna close this up and um the uh, a reminder that we really don't know what to do with things that are not questions in the question system. So we, we got to figure that out. I'm going to work on a way to tag it for comments so that the online audience can put comments in and we can decide, you know, like I, I got to figure that out. We're, we're going to work on that mechanism, but right now we're like questions or not, or chat, you know, and, and I think there's something in between that we have to figure out. Uh, Robert Laney had a bunch of great comments there that, that went into the question system and I feel it seems like we probably ought to just bring him on. It seems like there's a, there's a Friday discussion about how to start your business that's different than how to get into the industry. So um, I think that we're going to try to persuade Robert to join us actually in, yes, in please. the panel yes, please. And, uh, and have all of us talk through that. So I think that'd be, that'd be the next step for that. So we'll, we'll take that in. Probably, it won't be next Friday because next Friday is christmas for some of us and so that will be a just a two hour we're not we're not we'll still be here like you know like i'm not, not saying we're not going to be here but but well chris won't be here but i will be here um but but i'm not going to schedule anything for that day um anyway we are trying to get i think um i think we're going to be able to get this working i got i'm working on a couple of bits on thursday so thursday morning just as a little preview is uh um i think we're going to have the uh uh, it, it, my neighbor um, uh, wrote a song about Christmas um, that is well known, and so um, so anyway, so I think that we're gonna have have him come on. Um, 
it, it it's uh it's, so i don't know if you know who elmo trig is but he wrote a little song called grandma got run over by a reindeer <laughs> and so so anyway so he's he's my neighbor and uh we're just trying to figure out his internet connection is not very fast so i'm working on getting fiber from my house to his house um so that we can you know get the connections all working so i'm working on that this weekend uh if we get that all all done uh, he's gonna he's gonna play grandma and got run over a reindeer for us live and talk about the about the experience and everything else so our second hour on thursday which i think is perfect i could never do this before because of covid because he can't this is the first year evidently he He's like a superstar, you know, like, like, like for, for a month or six weeks, he just flies all over the world. And he's like the guy who wrote grandma got run over by a reindeer. So he's never home on around Christmas. And I was like, you're home. Let's like, we were talking about whether we're cutting down some shared trees. And so, so we were, we were going, uh, we were talking about it. And I was like, are you, are you going to actually be around? Let's do it. Let's do a live stream. So, so he's going to do it. He's going to do it with us on, on next Thursday. Go ahead, Chris. I've heard you can run ethernet very long distances. Alex. It's, he's a neighbor, but there's a big distance between our houses. It's more than, uh, I might need a thousand feet to get to his house. So he is the next house over, but it's not, it's the long it's a long way so anyway um you know we're, we're working on it so um anyway um i will uh i'll see you guys all tomorrow hey alex um, um yeah. a mitchell's put in can i toss those questions over into the online thing so that people can look yeah, at them sure, sure okay absolutely great. yep absolutely all right we'll see you guys all tomorrow uh it's saturday uh, it'll be all education thanks guys